Hello Designs Park, it's Redstone again. You know, I've been thinking it's about time I did another review. Cool, let's see what we've got. So, what we have here is a development kit for the Maxim Integrated DS28E18. And before we get into why you might want this, we need to have a little chat about serial interfaces and sensors. To simplify life for everyone, most sensors and other peripherals use standard interfaces. The two most common chip level interfaces are probably SPI and I2C, both of which date back to the 1980s. SPI, or Serial Peripheral Interface, is a de facto standard developed by Motorola. I2C, or Inter-Integrated Circuit, is a more formal standard established by Philips, which is now NXP. SPI is a synchronous communications protocol, so we need to supply a clock signal. And there are two data lines, a master in and a master out, which allow for full duplex bidirectional data transfers. Just like the Immortals in Highlander, there can be only one master in SPI, but you can have as many slaves as you have spare pins to act as a chip select, which is active low. The number of spare pins needed is one of the limiting factors of the scheme. There isn't a set maximum bit rate with SPI, it's essentially what you can get away with in your system, and that is usually a few tens of megabits per second. 32 megabits per second is routinely possible. Note that we need to supply power and ground to the peripherals too. I2C is sometimes referred to as the two-wire interface, as we only have our synchronising clock signal and a data line. Both of these are open drain, so you'll need pull-up resistors to keep them high. I2C can support more than one master. The master will supply the clock signal and initiate any bus transactions. Each slave on the bus has a unique 7-bit address, which is used after a start bit to determine which device should respond. A read-write bit, which determines which way the data will go, makes up the 8th bit of the first byte sent from the master. So I2C is a half duplex system with fixed standard data rates of 100 kilobits per second, 400 kilobits per second and 3.4 megabits per second. Note again that we're supplying power lines to the slave devices. Both SPI and I2C are great interfaces, which is why they've stood the test of time. But one disadvantage they both share is range. You're not realistically going to run either protocol much more than a metre from the master device. That's where Maxim's one wire can come in handy. As the name suggests, you use only one wire for data transfers. You'll need a, ground, a common ground between the master and slave as well, so you will end up cabling two wires, which is still less cumbersome than I2C's four wires or SPI's minimum of six wires. The real upside to one wire is the range, which can be more than 100 metres. However, the data rates are not as high, at 11.7 kilobits per second at standard rate, or 62.5 kilobits per second at high speed or overdrive mode. If you think about it though, this isn't really a problem for most uh, sensors or other peripherals that only send intermittent data, things like temperature or pressure gauges or heart monitors, They'll only be sending a few bytes every so often. One wire is a half duplex protocol. You don't need an external clock signal as the slave uses an internal clock that's synchronized by a signal from the master. Output pins are open drain and need a weak pull-up resistor. Slave devices can be powered from the data line, though there is an external power mode for devices that draw more than 10 milliamps. Each one-wire slave is given an unalterable, unique 64-bit ID at the factory, which is used as the device address on the one-wire bus. Eight of the 64 bits are a family code to identify the device type and its functionality. And that brings us nicely onto the DS2818, 
which is a bus bridge chip between one wire and either SPI or I2C, depending on how it's set up in software. The DS2818 pins can be set as the four pins used on SPI, like we have here, or the two pins used on I2C uh, plus two GPIO pins that you can use however you want. Now, the astute among you will probably be thinking, well, SPI and I2C are wildly different protocols to each other and one wire, so how do we get them to operate together? And the answer is the inbuilt command sequencer. We use this to set up whether we're using SPI or I2C, and we have 512 bytes of storage to hold commands to run on the sequencer, so that the DS2818 looks like a standard master device to any of the attached peripherals. The eval kit and software shows all this very nicely, so let's check that out now. Once we get our 2818 eval kit out of the box, this is what we have for our hardware. So first of all, we have our USB to one wire adapter, which also supplies the power to the rest of the kit. And this is our DS2818 board itself. It uses standard PMOD connectors and you can perhaps see maybe on the silk screen there that uh, it's marked out for SPI signals. And if we turn it over on the bottom, the silk screen is marked out for I squared C signals. We also have two other PMOD boards, uh, one with a MAX31722, that's an SPI temperature module, and the other with a DS7505, and that's an I squared C temperature module. We also get a power cable, uh, a USB power cable, and some jumpers. And if you look at the uh, temperature modules, you can see how simple they are. All you have on there is the temperature module themselves and a bypass capacitor. And this is what it looks like when we plug it all together. So let's plug this into our PC and see what the evaluation software looks like. So, when you run up the eval kit software, you should see something like this. As you can see, there are two tabs. The default one is what you might call a control tab. The leftmost window in this tab is a discovery window that lists any devices on the one wire bus. The next three windows are for the command sequencer. The first window allows you to manually program the sequencer commands into the sequencer memory, and that's shown in the second window. And then you can use the function commands to run the sequence in memory, and that's done from the third window. The final column on the right manages one wire speed and whether or not you need to address a specific device by its ROM ID. If there's only one device on the bus like we have here, we can skip this. Now, let's quickly look at the other tab. Here we have device settings for the DS2818, such as the protocol to use, whether we're using I2C or SPI, and there's a box for the I.O. pin settings. Now switching back to the control tab, let's find the device on the one wire bus. Great, so we've found a one wire device. This is the 2818. And as it's configured for I2C on the other side of the bridge, we know we're connecting to the DS7505 temperature sensor, as that has an I2C interface. We can scroll back up and see the sequence commands used to set this up. But the important thing for us here is that the command result is success. Hurrah! OK, so that means we're ready to try the canned example and read the temperature. We click on Get Temp and we see some frantic activity in the output window and we're delivered a temperature, 22.5 degrees. Great. And if we scroll up, we can follow the exact sequence of the commands that took us to the temperature reading. So starting on the first line, for example, RP resets the one-wire bus and waits for a presence pulse. CC skips the device ID search. 66 is the command start instruction. 02 is the command length, so two bytes this time. And those bytes are 55, which is a write to the configuration register. And we're writing 01 
and that sets the interface to I squared C. Now don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with going through all of the other stages. I just wanted to show you that the demo provides an example of the command sequences that programmers can pick up and run with in their own systems. So it makes it a bit easier to get started. Well, that wraps up our video on the DS2818 eval kit. Hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please leave a like and a comment below. See you soon. Bye.